describing the death experience. So this is one of the things about the shamanic death and rebirth experience is that you get to have a life review, except for you get to you get to still live and think about it. You, know? you get to realize and learn from it, rather than uh, when you die and you have your life review, and it's too late for you to do anything about it. Now, um, you do this out of body. Does that does does is an out of body experience a definitive part? Of the Amanita Muscaria experience? Well, not always, and it, it takes it, it takes uh, you know, pretty good training for that type of thing. But uh, it's definitely a, uh, one of the things, sure. And that's why I was talking about the spirit. You leave your body and you go into the heaven. There's different spots where you go. A lot of these, uh, a lot of the constellations tell us stories of the journeys through the stars of these heroes. It's, there's all these hero myths where. The, the person goes here and does that, and you can look at it through the different constellations as they proceed all around through the heavens. So the journey of the hero is through the stars, doing, going to all these different spots and doing these different things. This represents out of body experience. So on a on a time scale, when we're talking about um, the original um, ceremonies, the original way of life, in what time period was that? And then um, was it? Uh, was it a complete uh, slam dunk um, co-option uh, by Christianity or Catholicism or, or Judaism um, of these um, pagan rituals? And, and at what point did that happen? Yeah, well, it was pretty much a, what we would call a pharmacratic inquisition. <laughs> because in order for uh, a religious authority to make you pay homage to them and to get you to believe that they talk to the gods, not you, and that they're the ones that you have to go to in order to find out what God says, then they have to eliminate all the origins and the, and the knowledge of how man always throughout time has been able to communicate with the God. So even though they still retain all the symbols, the entryways to the buildings, the mushroom symbols in their architecture and their doorways, the religious uh, symbolism of the Eucharistic substance that you take, the sacrament that you take to have this communal experience with God. And by the way, it's sort of funny that uh, people, when they, they get the sacrament, some, some people just take it and it's just one of those things, you know, you just do because everybody's doing. But there's other people who actually, when that comes time to take of that substance, they understand what it's supposed to mean. And so when they take it, they take it ex expecting something. And a lot of people take it and they go, huh, oh, kind of weird, you know, I really expected this to be some type of an experience, but nothing happened. You know? mm -hmm. So they go, well, I took the, I took the wafer and, uh, and <laughs> drank the water, but nothing seemed to happen. And, uh, you know, remarkably, it's, uh, it's always your fault. You know, oh, well, you know, uh, you're unworthy. You're, <laughs> you must have done something wrong. You better go home and think about it. Come back and pass the typing and it, 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 something. So uh, it's, it's, it's remarkable that that they can get away with this fraud that they're pulling over on everybody. What they call the doctrine of transubstantiation, where they're supposed to take this wafer and go abracadabra, and it's supposed to become literally the body of God. Right. Well, excuse me, but no, that's not what it is. And, and we're not all cannibals. <laughs> yeah, we're not cannibals either. We're not actually eating a piece of the person, you know, or talking about an actual fleshy substance that is actually here. I want to ask if possibly the tree can can also um, symbolize that tunnel um, uh, to the heavens also, because at the top of it we always put a star. That's right, and that's exactly right. The star at the top represents the North Star. Right. Not the, not the star in the east. It doesn't represent Sirius, because the tree itself represents the same axis that I was talking about that goes from the South Pole to the North Pole. This, this tree of life. This axis mundi, the world axis, is represented in the stars. And as a result, it's like the macrocosm and the microcosm of the thing in the sky that's represented by us bringing down the tree into the house. And so all of these, all these symbols, if we really understand it, it's like the top of liberty. Libertas, the, uh, the goddess of liberty, which carries the Phrygian cap and wears the Phrygian cap. If we look all through this, the, uh, the uh, American history, he carries the caduceus, which represents drugs and the secret knowledge of drugs and plants. Mm -hmm. And she wears the liberty cap, which represents the liberty cap mushrooms. And her crown has seven points, 
or seven stars. And the seven stars represent the seven stars of... Can you tell me? Oh, the seven sisters? No, the seven stars no. of what? Well, if, it's, if her head represents the north... Oh. She always has like a snake at the bottom or the serpents come up the central column, right? That's right. Another one of our fractal representations. The seven stars represent the Big Dipper. Okay. Because this is our circumpolar yes. representation. It always goes from the south to the north. And there is the particular spot in the heavens. And it, it's represented by these stars. And it's also represented by the out-of-body journey of the shaman, which is also represented by this axis or world tree which connects again the heaven at the top to the uh, to the underworld or the snakes at the bottom where did the tradition of leaving out a little treat for santa come from you know when you're supposed to leave out uh, some cookies uh, or something like that well i wish i could answer that but that's not one of the things that I can answer. <laughs> I don't know. How about uh, the tradition of confessing? If you've been a good boy or a good girl, um, you know, you're supposed to... That must be the life review then, you know, right. when you're supposed to see if you're, you know, if you're naughty or not, you know. Um, there are lots of... I forgot the Christmas carols that, that um, you know, ask children to, you know, well, if you get presents because you've been good or, right. you know, maybe you've been naughty. He yeah, knows okay. if you've been sleeping. He knows when you're awake. Right. He knows if you've been bad or good. So be good for goodness sake. That's right. Now that's that's pretty cool because if you think about that, that is like our our uh, our creed. You know, do no harm. Right? right. Do as thou wilt, but harm no one. Or the golden rule: do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Don't hurt other people. This is the golden rule. It's the general law. Everything else beyond that is an elaboration. Now, I get into trouble with people sometimes because when they read my book, they go, Oh, you know, you, you totally tore apart the Ten Commandments in your book, which is what I do. And I, I, I explain to them, I say, Look, I have to do that because any time that you try to put your own belief on something and you try to take that law and expand it out into something else, you're into trouble because now you're making a man-made law that you're saying is the word of God. Mm -hmm. That's where we get into trouble like uh, prohibition of sexual freedom, you know, mm -hmm. adultery, fornication, mm -hmm. ooh, laws of God, you're not supposed to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't particularly believe that. Mm -hmm. In our, in our uh, Santa Claus tradition, it doesn't say anything about that. It just says... <laughs> You know, if you're, if you're bad or good, what does that have to do with, you know, <laughs> having a good time? <laughs> I don't think it's always associated, you know. What other uh, commandments uh, do people get or feel that have been offed or offended by your writings? Well, it's like uh, the one that says don't covet, you know. Don't look at things that other people have and say, ooh, I like that, I want that. Right. So thou shalt not covet. Well, what does that mean? Of course, this is one that was written by those that have or those that have not. <laughs> exactly. You know, don't look at my stuff because it's my stuff, you know. And don't think you can have it or even want it because, you know, you have your spot. You have your couch and your TV and your job you go to 8 to 5 that you'll never be able to afford this Maserati mm -hmm. or whatever it is, so. You know, I don't think this is a, I don't think that, and especially when they start to tell you, look, if you're committing the sin in your mind, then you've committed the sin, you know, just as good. Like if you look at a girl and say, oh man, she's so cute, you know, just for the flash you think she would be wonderful to kiss. Mm -hmm. Now you're going to hell forever. You know? <laughs> they always 